Thank you, Robert. Uh, feasibility studies. Uh, there are two types, those that are done well and those that aren't done so well. And uh, I wanted to talk about the process today, um, not the boring technical bits, but uh, the way in which you go about it. Um, to start off with, uh, feasibility studies are quite complex for mining projects. Um, and the initial thing to do is to develop um, the corporate strategy and plan to go forward. Um, I find that if you don't have this keystone in place, all of the rest can fall apart around it. And uh, it, it's an area that a lot of people miss out on. So <coughs> you need to have the direction that the company wants to go to and the way in which that they want to get there so that they can then plan their way forward. And the feasibility study being complex scenario, it's much easier if you break it down into steps. Um, it's easier to, uh, to do simple things than, than difficult things. And so um, the industry has, over many years, uh, developed a process of feasibility studies that, um, that uh, work really well if you follow them clearly. I've noticed of late that companies um, want to think they want to save time and save money by short-circuiting the steps. So <coughs> they might have been lucky, put in a few drill holes, got a bit of mineralisation and think, wow, we've got, we're onto something here, let's do a feasibility study. And, uh, and they cut out all of the, f the initial steps and try and do it along the way. And from my experience, this is a formula for losing time and wasting money. So let's have a look at the steps that we should be going through on a, on a logical feasibility study process. The first, it's the idea. You develop your corporate strategy, you work out where you want to go to and the idea that you want to pursue. <coughs> you take that into a, into a scoping study and the scoping study determines the initial viability of the potential project that you're getting involved in. This leads into a pre-feasibility study and this is the engine room of where everything happens in the feasibility study process. It's the most important part of the process and it is the one that people most like to skip. And it's the option study. Every mining project has options. There are different options available. And it's a matter of investigating all of these options and determining the most viable option that you can take into a feasibility study. And the feasibility study just takes the most viable option from the pre-feasibility study and improves your confidence in it. The concept study is, uh, is where you get your ideas and you put them together, uh, do your SWOT analysis, doesn't get to the stage of being a, uh, a proper risk analysis because you're not quite sure what you've got as yet. Um, and uh, once you've got this view, you then go back and review your corporate strategy and make sure that what you're planning on doing will fit in with that corporate strategy. Um, I'll give you an example of um, what I think is, was a, a really good uh, concept study. It was done by Western Mining Corporation uh, when they were looking for a copper project. Um, Roy Woodhall, Woodhall was the uh, chief geologist at Western Mining at the time. He was a very successful geologist. Western Mining was doing very well. They had a number of mines up and running. They had their new nickel province down in Campbell that was going really well, but Roy Woodhall wanted a uh, copper deposit. And they had uh, been looking at uh, three quite large potential copper deposits uh, around Australia, spent $20 million in the 1960s, which was a lot of money then, and each one of these deposits didn't prove successful. Um, he sent a graduate geologist to Warburton, which is out on the 
border between Western Australia and the Northern Territory. And this fellow was a, was a brilliant student at the UWA, University of Western Australia. He also had a bit of a bent on chemistry as well as geology and uh, Roy sent him out there and he came back with the view that the mineralisation there was in a style that they hadn't recognised before. And um, he convinced Roy Woodhall, uh, Woodhall that, uh, that this should be investigated to find large gold deposits and in the first instance WMC Western Mining at that time supported him in a uh, doctorate thesis <laughs> and he determined that his, uh, his concept that he had at that time was right and that together with a, a geophysicist they determined that the Mount Gunson copper deposit in South Australia was the logical place to go and have a look to test his, uh, his concept. And they, uh, they found that in fact the, the mineral style of mineralisation did in fact exist in this deposit and that uh, they convinced Roy Woodall that they should take it further and Roy was a pretty smart fellow. He put together a team of very senior people, um, very smart people, a geophysicist, two senior geologists and, um, and a structural geologist. And uh, they, uh, they used the concept that uh, Douglas Haynes had and um, decided that in fact Mount Gunson wasn't the place to be but it was quite a few hundred kilometres to the north on the same liniment structure. And it was, uh, it was uh, a structure that went right across Australia and the geophysics mapped out a a signature that they thought would be a deep-seated copper deposit. Um, so Roy Woodall gave them the money, they went up and drilled one hole and underneath 300 metres of cover they intersected 40 metres of copper mineralisation, which I thought was a pretty good concept to go from a, from a, a project in Warburton to think about it, find a logical spot drill under 300 metres of cover and hit the target. <laughs> so that's what a concept is all about. And, and it's, it's not a process that people do rigor rigorously. And um, I think in Western Mining's corporation's um, uh, method was excellent in that they applied senior people to a problem. And, and they rigorously analysed the problem and they came up with a solution and it worked. And that's Olympic Dam, of course. So um, the concept phase is a, is, a, uh, is a very important phase, and it's one that's quite over, uh, often overlooked. It generally is a bloody good idea that a geologist had, let's go and have a look. <coughs> and I think it should be done a little bit better than that. <coughs> so the concept, once it's determined, moves on to a scoping study where you identify whether your concept has any viability. Um, you do a risk analysis. Um, you, uh, you may end up with an indicated and inferred resource. Invariably, it's inferred, um, but that's OK. But it's the time that we start finding out if we can make any money out of this. One of the things that uh, exploration companies get carried away with, and it's generally because they're run by geologists, um, is that they need to have more and more millions of ounces, millions of pounds of copper, whatever, whatever, and they keep drilling and drilling and drilling without giving any thought to the net present value of their money. And it's a, a much better process to sit back, determine what you need to get into production, and then identify and increase the confidence in that but still having, uh, having uh, a bit of a reality check on whether there are possible extensions to it. So within the scoping study, you do cash flow, simple cash flow models because you're trying to make money. Um, let's not get away from that fact. Um, we're not here to produce ounces of gold or pounds of copper or pounds of uranium we've heard today. We're here to make money for the shareholders. and. Uh, and get a return on the capital invested. And, and I think that that's a very important thing. So, dear to my heart, I like cash flow modelling. Um, you start it as soon as you can. 
and you get a view of the of the potential financial viability of a project, not just its technical viability. So you discard any options that uh, that may come up, and this will take you into a scoping study. And the story that we had with with the uh, Olympic Dam, they uh, went back out there and they drilled another eight holes and they never intersected any, any copper mineralisation. You can imagine how tough that was, drilling under 300 metres of cover. Uh, but the ten hole, tenth hole did intersect uh, 170 metres of what then was considered to be economically viable copper mineralisation. And, uh, and then the remaining ten holes indicated that they had strike length of several kilometres, the length of the ten holes that they drilled, and Western Mining uh, were able to announce that they thought that they had a major copper, uranium and gold discovery. Notice they never announced any resources yet. And um, <coughs> I mentioned the uranium, and that's a, that's a pretty tricky issue because uh, Australia at that time had a ban on the export of uranium other than from two deposits, so they had a two mine policy. And, um, and this could have been what we'll see later on as a black swan, because the uranium was, uh, was interlocked with the copper, and so you couldn't get the copper without the, getting the uranium, and there was a ban on mining uranium. So this would have been part of the Western Mining's risk analysis, which is really important to go through. You know, what do we do here? We're not allowed to export <laughs> export our product. We think we've got a pretty flash deposit happening here. So what do you do? And um, obviously they determined to go ahead, which was a good decision to make. And um, they probably thought that seeing that this was potentially so large and so such a valuable resource that the government would have to do something about it. Um, and in fact the decision was made for the government of the day, they got voted out, uh, both federally and state, and the policy was changed to a three mine policy which would have allowed uh, Western Mining to <coughs> export uranium. Um, uh, we heard this morning about how things can change, and that's one of the things that changed for Western Mining and allowed, allowed the deposit to proceed. The pre-feasibility study is an option study um, where you review all of the options that you think are viable to the project and this, this is where most of the work gets done. Um, and you, you have to be confident in the work that you're doing uh, is able to be carried forward to a feasibility study. And so it means doing most of the work. And you do most of the work on most of the options. So this can become very, very expensive. So the trick is that you have to eliminate options that are not going to be as good as another option. In other words, you have to determine which is the best option as soon as possible so to, to reduce the expenditure of capital. <coughs> and, and this takes smart people to do it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not, not, a, not a process that is to be taken lightly and it's a process that should be done by people with, with experience because uh, you're spending a lot of money here maybe reviewing options that somebody who's got more open eyes can see is not as good as another option. Um, the, the important thing here at the end then is that you get an independent technical review from somebody who's not intimately associated with the project. So it depends on the size of the company of course um, and it may be that it's an outside consultant, if it's a large company it may be it's an inside consultant. Uh, we tend to find that the large companies like outside consultants to do this sort of work anyway. Um, because uh, you can get a little bit too close to the to the project, and and we want to make sure that it gets uh, gets reviewed, and all of the glitches can be found, and and mitigation processes put in place. <coughs> we then come to the feasibility study, and this is where <coughs> we determine if a project is feasible or not. 
So you do not, you are unable to determine whether a project is feasible at the pre-feasibility study stage by definition. Uh, a lot of companies like to think that once they start a feasibility study process that they have a project that's feasible. Um, most of them aren't. And, and this causes a bit of a problem uh, with the way in which particularly junior companies announce things to the stock exchange. And, and um, Joe mentioned in his speech about over-promoting a company. Um, it's a dangerous thing to do because you back yourself into a corner. You make your life very difficult um, if you over-promote your project. Tell the truth and tell it the way that it is and you will get respect. The feasibility study requires a lot of risk management and it requires doing a lot of things that we didn't do 20 years ago in a feasibility study and, and they're now becoming very, very expensive. And it's generally grouped in, into what we call sustainability. It's environmental and social investigations. Um, and now it's very difficult to get finance unless you have a really spot on environmental and social section to your feasibility studies. Uh, and they are very, very expensive. Um, we've just finished a pre-feasibility study in, a, in an African country and the, uh, and the project manager was telling me that other than drilling, their environmental and social aspects of their pre-feasibility study cost more than the technical aspects of the pre-feasibility study. So um, they're things that, that we have a different view today about uh, where we spend the money on and we've got to be prepared to do it and it should be part of the, the corporate strategy. And I, and I noticed that um, um, Anglo-American had up on the first slide their responsibility, uh, environmental and social. So it, it's a big thing in the mining industry now and, and we shouldn't ignore it. Um, there are consequences to feasibility studies. Um, um, if they're done well, the consequences can be good. Um, if they're not done not so well, the consequences can be bad. And there are a number of things here um, I just wanted to discuss briefly. Um, one is uh, capital expenditure. <laughs> People think that, uh, that the major point of a feasibility study is actually getting it into production. Of course, we have a view that it also includes everything that happens after production. But um, companies tend to focus on what the money is required to bring it into production. So the pre-production capex, um, and and this um, this uh, area is the the capex. A little bit about markets. Joe told us a bit about it today. I just wanted to pick up on difference differences that are presently happening between AIM and um, um, and the TSX venture market. Um, not that one is better than another, but depending on what you're looking for, you may be better off to view looking at going one market instead of another market because they operate slightly differently. Um, black swans, um, and also down in the bottom uh, right hand corner we have the sustainability, environmental, social aspects to feasibility studies. With the capital, um, we can see in this first project in Mexico that a pre-feasibility study had done with 0.54 billion um, capex, which is pretty good. Feasibility study was 0.57 billion, uh, which is pretty close to the feasibility the, the um, pre-feasibility study. So you would think that they got it all pretty well under control, given that a uh, that a feasibility study will. Um, uh, just get a better definition, uh, a more confidence in the feasibility, pre-feasibility study numbers. So that would have given me a bit of confidence if I was the director of that company. But um, what happened when we 
built it, it cost us nearly double. And that would have caused me a lot of heartache. Because we get committed to these things and you're locked in. And can you imagine what this project, uh, the net present value of this project would have been when they anticipated spending $600 million and they ended up spending a bit over a, a billion dollars. It's pretty hard to recover that $400 million in the net present value. Um, a different thing happened in the in the project in um, in uh, Alaska. Uh, the pre-feasibility study said 2.6 billion, and uh, the feasibility study said 5.3. So what happened in the pre-feasibility study? Were there options that weren't investigated properly? I, I don't know, but they are too far apart. Those numbers are too far apart, and in fact the feasibility study should have gone back to the pre-feasibility study stage and updated the pre-feasibility study because something went wrong during the study process. Um, and then uh, when they built it, it was 26% up. It seems to be that that's the sort of number that happens uh, because people are a bit over-optimistic. Should I say they're too conservative with what they put in as the number needed when in fact the number needed is generally always more than what you anticipate. <coughs> um, it must be human nature, I think. In Australia, I've got one here, but I'll give you three, um, uh, or two. Um, is the, the, um, this is the Carrara Iron Ore Project. Um, feasibility study, 1.7 billion. Uh, 2011, 2.57, I think they're now about 3.8. Um, it's, uh, it's a really tricky thing, you know, like the spending all of this extra money. How does that, how does that work and how, how does it get justified? Uh, Citic Pacific bought Balmoral um, in the Pilbara. It's a magnetite project. Um, and they, uh, they purchased this um, mid-2000s for, uh, for 600 million. Feasibility study at that time said to spend 2.4 billion to get it up and running. Um, they're now at 6.1 <laughs> and nowhere near production. How do you handle that? You know, how, how does that work? Um, that you can be that far out? And these are just examples of feasibility studies done not so well. In the markets, you can see here, uh, and Joe, Joe touched on this, 2011 AIM had 10, this is just mining related um, transactions, uh, for an average of $7.2 million. Um, TSXV had 43. Uh, for 3.49 million average and and so what we've got here is a different sort of a market um, and it followed on in the first half of two, 2012 aimed did 4 for 7.74 million uh, TSXV did 25 for 1.61 um, they're two different markets and they work in two different ways the, the TSX has that share flow through scheme uh, when you run out of money, you go in and you can issue shares to people who have got lots of money and they can use it all as a bit of a deduction, say, um, and so they can raise small amounts of money uh, and it's a little easier. I wish Australia did the same thing, but they don't. Um, they've tried and failed. Um, whereas uh, AIM has the nominated advisor system, nomads, and they are then more conscious about bigger projects, bigger amounts of money, and that's exactly what happens. So if you've got a good project and you want a lot of money, these sorts of numbers, and it may change around next year, these sorts of numbers would indicate that AIM's probably a good place to go. If you just want to top up to pay your uh, holiday um, costs and your kids' school fees as a director, then you might have been better off being in AIM because you can raise smaller amounts of money. Um, black swans come into the risk category and risk is something that is very, very important in feasibility studies and maybe had these other companies we were talking about on CapEx done their risk analysis, risk matrix with more due diligence, 
then they would have found the black swans. And one thing that I, I, I can say is that if you use an international consultancy, and there are a number of them, and, uh, and they've seen lots of projects. And uh, international consultancy has probably seen more projects than the major mining companies of BHP and Rio. And, and you should draw on that knowledge because they pull the teams together that can do this sort of work in a risk analysis. And, and it's a very important thing um, that all of the options are investigated for risk. Sustainability, uh, very quickly, it's a very, very expensive thing. And uh, Rand Gold Resources off their webpage spending heaps and heaps of money on it doing lots of things and it goes right down to the welfare of the workers on how they handle that and this all should be part of your feasibility study and and it's important to get it right get it wrong and you could be in south america halfway through the construction phase the local people don't like what you're doing you're going to take their water away from them they close your project down, you've spent two billion dollars and you're not going to get it back. And it started a long time ago, I don't know why we didn't recognise it, I happened to be there on the day that it happened in Papua New Guinea when the local people who didn't like the way they were being treated by Bougainville Copper blew up a power pylon, stopped the mine and that was in 1987 and it has not opened to this day one of the largest mines in the world. A couple of blokes with a few sticks of jelly night shut down the largest mine in the world because they weren't happy with the way that the company was treating them. And we've got to get this right, otherwise it could happen to you. Thank you.